What's going on everybody? Mortem here, this time bringing you my story series for Pillars of Eternity. The first one, that is. This video is primarily going to be for people who would like to see the story of Pillars of Eternity and not much else. I'm not covering the side quests in any great depth. There are a couple points throughout the story where you have to do some side quests, but for the most part we're going to be sticking to the critical path of the game, as the game itself likes to call it, which is to say the main story. Beyond that, again, not really covering side quests in any particular depth. The game is divided into four acts, so I will pretty much be trying to do a part per act. That said, Act 2 is basically the bulk of the actual game. Acts 1, Acts 3, and Acts 4 are not particularly long or in-depth or engaging. Act, act 2 is basically the bulk of like probably 70% of the game. So just keep that in mind as we're going forward. But today we're going to be covering Act 1 in Part 1 here. So let's dive into it. Again, not really covering uh, character creation in any great depth, but suffice to say it's very kind of D&D-ish with its approach. There are classes and stuff that you can pick through. Kind of all the standard ones you would think of. I actually cover more about it in a separate video that's not really this. But suffice to say, once you've created your character, you find yourself en route to the Gilded Vale in Deerwood. Now, depending on the backstory you chose, you might actually get some different options in the conversations with the camp here that you've set up because you yourself have fallen ill with an illness that is kind of not really explained, like stomach pains or something. And the caravan master, Odima or o Odima or something like that, stops the caravan for the night. You guys are going to make camp and get back to it in the morning because they think there might be a storm blowing through anyway. Now you're on your way to Gilded Vale because the Lord of the Land is actually offering land and houses and things for settlers that come to the area and agree to work the land. So like I mentioned, you get sick. You are assigned one of the caravan guards, Kaliska, who is going to take you and kind of search for berries that should be nearby that, you know, could be brewed into something to kind of help ease your stomach or whatever. So you guys go do that. You can have a conversation with Kaliska, but, you know, whatever. You do find the berries, and then you are supposed to go meet another caravan guard who had found water for you to drink after you found the berries. So once you actually go to meet up with this guard, you do and find out that he was murdered by none other than Glanfathens. So Air Glanfathen, I, th I think I'm pronouncing that right, but that general term, they guard a set of ruins that you are camped outside of. Now the Glanfathens here say that someone has trespassed upon their territory there because again they protect these ruins if you trespass they will kill you pretty widely known now no one from your camp has gone inside as far as you know so you try to basically reason with them and be like that totally wasn't us but they're not really about it and try to kill you anyway now once this happens you head back to the camp which you had previously left and find out that pretty much all of the caravan has been slaughtered by glanfathens they have a hostage with them and you can kind of negotiate with the leader a little bit if you have the right skill checks you can kind of save the guy who's being held hostage however it's not really worth it and you'll see why here in like a little bit it doesn't really matter what happens here because regardless of how this conversation goes you're going to probably wind up fighting these guys and then lastly a storm comes through that the leader of the caravan mentioned before he died it is called a Beowak. It's sort of a, uh, again, I think I'm pronouncing that right. It's sort of a spirit storm that is known to rip people's souls from their body. And they are pretty much unsurvivable. You basically have to seek shelter or you're more than likely going to die. Having just fought off these Glanfathens that had attacked the caravan, you and Kaliska make haste for the entrance to the ruins you were camped outside of that the Glanfathens were protecting before the Beowak comes through and this is how you were able to get through it. Now there's a short little dungeon here that you will find your way through. It's very short. There's like two paths through it. You can uh, find a chisel and go through a wall or solve a puzzle that involves some uh, tile traps on the floor, either or. You're going to get through the ruins here and you're going to come out on the other side into like a little clearing and you're going to see a hooded figure and a group of three other people performing a ritual with some sort of ancient machinery. Now we don't know exactly what this is at the time, but basically the hooded robed figure gives a speech about the other three sacrificing themselves. He walks off, they begin their ritual, and it kills them. It does something to them. They seem to have sacrificed themselves in service of whatever this is. And you kind of black out from here. And when you come to, you find out that Kaliska is dead. 
The three guys that I mentioned have turned to stone or something like that down below in the little clearing area. You yourself have survived, which is strange because like, you know, everyone around you is dead. You should be dead. And as you get up and start moving around, it mentions that your vision is weird. You start seeing things in the corner of your vision that just don't actually seem to be there. Now from here, being the sole survivor of this caravan, you need to make haste for Gilded Vale where you were originally headed. Now to do that, you're gonna actually have to pass through a place called the Veilwood, which involves some quests and stuff you may or may not go and do. But regardless, you're gonna head to Gilded Vale, which is a short ways away. Now once you get there, you're gonna be stopped by a Magister of sorts, and he's going to tell you all about the Hollowborn Crisis. So the reason this Lord is offering land and things like that to settlers is because the Deerwood is under the grips of this thing called the Hollowborn Crisis or otherwise known as Widewind's Legacy. Now you learn a lot from this conversation. This is a huge info dump if you've never played the game before. Widewind is a guy who decided he was the avatar of the god Aeothus and attacked the Deerwood. He was killed with a giant bomb. They literally blew him up. However, ever since that happened, which was called the Saints War not too long ago, children have been being born as what is called hollowborn, which is basically that they don't have a soul. They're, they're lifeless. You might as well be giving birth to a zombie. Like it's physically alive, but the lights aren't on, so to speak. Now this same magister also tells you that the Lord of the land, Raedric, his wife is with child and do any day, and because of that, he can't process your stuff with all this land that I mentioned earlier. And also that he hired some animancer to help make sure his wife's child was not born hollowborn, but that didn't work out. And that's what the deal is with all these uh, bodies in the tree that you should be able to see here, which is obviously kind of the biggest thing going on. The Magister here tells you that basically there's nothing he can do right now. Go rest at the inn or wherever and come back to him later which is pretty much what you should do. If you choose to go to the inn, you can meet Aloth. Aloth is one of the many companions you can get, but isn't really the focus of this, so we won't spend a ton of time on him, but suffice to say, if you're not going for the achievement for doing the game solo, it's wise to pick him up. Now, once you rest, you can go back and talk to the Magister again. Now, when you go back to talk to the Magister, right before you had gone to go rest, the bell tolling out that the Lord's child had been born had rung out across the town and basically it wasn't good news, something had happened. Now once you are talking to the Magister here the second time, he explains that the child wasn't born well and that basically it was uh, either hollowborn or died during birth or etc etc. So basically the Magister is like, you should probably leave. That said, when you had rested just a moment ago, you had a dream about a dwarven woman hanging from the tree that we saw earlier, the very striking tree with the dead bodies that's real hard to miss. If you walk up to that tree after this conversation and basically being told to leave the Gilded Vale, you can go talk to, well, not talk to per se, but you can walk up to the tree where this dwarven woman's body is hanging from. And then you start talking to it all of a sudden in kind of a weird way, or its spirit, that is. The dwarf woman here explains that she was an animancer, a person who studies souls, uh, which we already knew that. We kind of got that conversation from the Magister. However, she explains that the reason you're having this conversation is because whatever happened to you back there in those ruins actually turned you into a watcher. A watcher is someone who can study souls, basically. They can see things that aren't necessarily there. And you kind of tell her that, like, you know, ever since uh, that Beowack that you survived that you shouldn't have been able to survive, this has been happening. And, you know, you need help with this. Obviously, the land with this town isn't going to work out with everything that we just learned a bit ago. And from there, this woman directs you to a place called Cadnua. Apparently, there is another watcher who used to live around here. But because of all of the craziness going on with the Hollowborn situation, basically anybody involved in animancy or souls in any way, uh, such as a watcher, because, you know, you can literally see them, isn't real popular right now. Now. So Marowald was basically kind of like pushed to the edge of a place called Cadnua. He had already been living there, kind of helping people out, but lately he's been ostracized more than normal. Now as we leave that conversation with the dwarf woman, we can talk to the guy who's standing just outside the tree, who is actually Adair. He is a veteran of the Saints War. You can pick him up as a companion as well. That's why I mentioned him. Again, we're not really going to you know, talk about that too much. The main objective of the actual story is to leave the Gilded Vale and go to Cadnua. 
Now this actually is where the first bit of exploration begins. You can't go to the main city just yet. However, you can explore a, a decent couple of areas if you cho choose before you actually go to Cadnua. The only one that I'm going to mention here is Magrin's Fork because in Magrin's Fork, you can meet a priest of Magrin, Magrin being the goddess of fire and trials. Her priest, Durrance is his actual name, basically says that he saw you in a vision and basically demands to accompany you. From here, we can head to Cadnua. Cadnua is an old abandoned stronghold of sorts out in the wilderness of the Deerwood. Now, once we arrive there, we'll immediately notice someone singing outside the gates. It turns out that this person is Kana. He is a, a Mawa chanter, which is a Mawa is a race and chanter is a class. And he is looking for a tome of knowledge in the keep. So you can also take him along with you as a companion too, should you so choose. Now, the keep itself is infested with ghosts and skulders or ghouls or whatever they're called. But basically, it's like a, a ghoul, more or less. You know, pretty much standard fantasy stuff. Uh, anywhere dead bodies are found, that kind of thing. Now, once we actually start exploring inside the keep, we'll notice this big throne, and it talks to you, actually. It turns out that this is known as the steward. The steward was the person who originally designed the keep when it was built over 200 years ago. Because it was her greatest work, she asked to be made part of it somehow, and somehow they managed to transfer her soul into like the keep itself. And she speaks through this bit of statue. Now, she explains that the keep, for all intents and purposes, belongs to Merewald. However, Merewald hasn't been contacting her lately. He's using his powers as a watcher to keep her unaware of his location. And she also explains that her and Merewald used to uh, be working on fixing up the keep together. And also, lastly, she'll tell you that the keep is built on a thing called the Endless Paths which is like a huge, crazy maze down below the keep that involves some other stuff. Now from here, we need to find Merewald. It's pretty easy. You just actually go down the door that opens after you talk to the steward, which is the prison area, get through there, go down one more floor into what is actually the first level of the Endless Paths, and you can kill some monsters to find a key or just pick lock the door like right at the beginning of this map, and that's where Merewald is. And then you can talk to him. What I didn't tell you is that as you are exploring the keep, you will be running across spirits. So these spirits, now that you know that you're a watcher, are actually people's souls from the past. These are these are dead people that you're seeing. And if you talk to them, they kind of explain their soldier, like uh, their story, basically. One of them is a soldier. One of them is a marauder. It all kind of seems incoherent for the most part. Like it's kind of like why is it telling me this stuff, kind of thing. But once you get to Merowald, that uh, pretty much explains itself real quick. So, Merowald is absolutely insane. However, you will get some useful information out of him. Merowald explains what a watcher actually is, that you see souls of the dead, or the living. And he also explains that you can use this information to help people, because if you can see someone's soul, and their past lives soul, because Merowald is where we find out about the concept of the wheel if you hadn't picked it up yet. It's possible to learn about this well beforehand, especially if you did your prior research to playing the game, but Merowald explains it kind of better, and I think it's the appropriate place to talk about this. In the world of Aeora for Pillars of Eternity, souls get recycled. So every time someone dies, their soul returns to what they call the wheel, which is a natural metaphysical process that essentially, pulls souls to these giant green Audra stones that are around the world and then recycles them into someone else. However, when they get reborn, they don't remember who they were. And usually it's to that soul's detriment, like they're less than they were before. Merewold explains that the reason you probably survived the Biowak, and you can also learn this from the Dwarven woman earlier, is that you are more than likely in possession of what is known as a strong soul, which means basically when you are recycled through the wheel, your soul doesn't break apart like a lot of other souls do, which is also more than likely why you became a watcher when this Beowak went through. Now, the other important thing we learn from Merewald here is that the reason you've been having these crazy visions since this happened is that you suffered from something that is called an awakening. So basically, when these souls get recycled, they're told to forget their past lives, so to speak. However, an awakening is when the person who is living right now remembers a past life. And that personality or memories or traits suddenly spring to the surface. This usually involves some sort of insanity to ensue. And this is where we find out that this is what is happening to Merewald and is also what is happening to you. So the reason Merewald is insane 
is because he was also awakened after a while, and these spirits are taking control of him, and he's slowly losing his mind. This is apparently a very common problem for Watchers to have because of their innate ability to actually see souls. They become awakened very often. It's, it's a very common thing that happens to them. So basically, being a Watcher combined with an awakening tends to drive you insane because you can actually interact with souls on more of a level than the average person can. Now, when you ask Marowald, like, you know, is there something that can be done about this? He tells you to find the leaden key. He says it more fanciful than that, that basically you need to go to a city and find members of the leaden key. Now, after this, Marowald will attack and try to kill you because his uh, persona personalities, personas, whatever you want to call them, decide that, you know, you're an enemy and you need to die because he's insane. So you wind up having to kill Marowald in self-defense. And after that, you can decide what to do with his soul, which is a big moment and it becomes kind of a big part of the lore that like, in addition to being a watcher, you can manipulate soul energy to some degree. So when someone dies like this in an important way, you can direct their soul as to like where they need to go to find their next life, that kind of thing. It becomes a major plot point later and it's just kind of like the tip of the iceberg right here. And basically you can return him to the wheel and kind of let him pass from this world. You can take his knowledge into yourself, or you can have him basically also guard the grounds of Cadnua as well. Now from here, we can go back upstairs, talk to the steward, and basically explain that Marewald died. But she already kind of knows this because she felt him pass. Now the steward will basically tell you that two things here. One, the place that Marewald was telling us about is actually Defiance Bay, which is a city not too far from here. But in order to get there, you're going to have to fix up the keep, which actually has a double meaning because Marewald was the owner of Cadnua, so to speak, as far as the actual castle itself was concerned, because it seems to have a bit of a mind of its own, as you probably noticed. The steward basically explains that, you know, if you want, you can help her fix this place back up, which you're going to have to do to fix the wall to get to Defiance Bay. And after that, Cadnua becomes your stronghold, which you can again help fix up and you kind of become the owner of this place. And throughout the story, you can kind of like, you know, make renovations and that kind of thing. But from here, she also explains that in addition to going to Defiance Bay, he talked, Marowald that is, talked about a queen that was. And the steward explains that that's more than likely Wodica, who has a temple in Defiance Bay. And you should probably start your search there once you get there. After this, you can construct the wall that you need to get through to go to Defiance Bay, which is instantaneous because apparently like the materials or something were set aside. However, in the future, every upgrade you make to the keep will take days of in-game time. After that's done, you head out towards Defiance Bay. Along the way, you can pick up yet another companion, Sagani, which is a dwarven ranger who comes with a pet who I recommend you pick up. She's fun. And then after that, you head to Defiance Bay. Now, upon entering Defiance Bay, that ends Act 1. That's where we're going to leave it, guys. That is Act 1 for you. We were going to the Gilded Vale. We got hit by a Beowack, managed to survive it, somehow became a Watcher as a result, went to the Gilded Vale, where we found out that we weren't going to get any land. We're basically told to leave because, uh, you know, you're weird. We had a conversation with a Dwarven woman after a dream told us to, who explained that we're a Watcher now, we can see souls, recommended that we go talk to Marewald, who was also a Watcher. We went to talk to him. He is crazy, which is foreshadowing of what is likely to happen to us if we don't do something about the awakening we had, which is what caused us to become a Watcher when we were in the Beowack. And then we headed to Defiance Bay. So ends Act 1. Act 2, like I mentioned, is actually kind of the bulk of the game where we will start hunting down these leaden key people who it would appear were actually the people at the machinery who caused, seemingly, the Beowack and us to become a Watcher and thus our awakening, which is probably going to slowly start to drive us insane. So there is Act 1, guys. There you go. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please like, comment, subscribe, and stick around. But thank you so much for watching. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day. What's going on everybody? Mortem here, this time bringing you part two 
of our Story of Pillars of Eternity series. Now just as a reminder, I won't be covering side quests or anything so much, but just the main plot and only really going over side quests were absolutely necessary and not in a ton of detail. So last time we left off with having become a Watcher, finding out that we were a Watcher, taking the Keep of Cad Nua, and getting a lead that the people who did this to us were in Defiance Bay. That brings us to Defiance Bay. Before we do anything, I just want to mention that if you want to recruit Palagina, the paladin companion who is also a sort of godlike, you can find her in the docks area of the city and you have to do a short quest for the Valian Trading Company there before you can actually recruit her. She is the only companion that you actually have to do a quest beforehand before recruiting her as opposed to getting her immediately. But that said, we need to find Wodica's Temple, which is in the first fires area of Defiance Bay. Now when we get there, we're going to be using our Watcher powers to immediately see that there's a ghost walking around. And using our Watcher powers, if we speak to this ghost and his soul, it will basically explain to us that the Temple of Wodica was burned down. And if you ask it the appropriate questions, it'll tell you that the basement area of the temple is still in place, but you can't get there because there's a pile of rubble over it. So the ghost doesn't seem to actually know that. He does, however, tell us that you can probably still access it from the catacombs area, which is just adjacent to the temple's basement. So now we need to go to the catacombs. We'll find the catacombs in the Copper Lane district of Defiance Bay, the entrance anyway. And then we need to make our way through the catacombs to the other side where we will find the temple basement area. Now, right as we step in, we're going to see a vision of the robed man we saw earlier talking to seemingly a new recruit about why they chose to join the Leaden Key. Now, if we move forward just a bit, there's actually going to be guards. Now, they're going to stop us. This can go one of a couple ways. If we have our Wodica's mask, which we can find on several people who have been dead throughout the sewers up to this point, we can actually take that mask, put it on, and then walk through the temple past the guards that way, or we can pass a small check to walk past them peacefully as well. Now, once we actually get into the temple basement, our goal is going to be to get to the ritual room where the guards actually told us to go because we need to find an acolyte there who seems to be in charge of the immediate sect of the Leaden Key here. Now once you go in and this situation revolves itself one way or another, you'll eventually find out by using your Watcher abilities on this woman's soul that she has been doling out tasks to Leaden Key members around the city. And specifically, you're going to have visions of a tower, a prisoner, and some ruins. Now using your watcher abilities you can get a bit more descriptive detail of these areas, which I recommend you do, but for the sake of this video we don't really need to cover them. Now what these actually wind up being are three different leads about what's going on around Defiance Bay and what we need to do to keep tracking down the leaden key here. Now the easiest one to start with is actually the prisoner vision. And through that dialogue, we can find out that there seems to be a prisoner by choice in some insane asylum of some sort. Now, if you do some walking around and exploring, you're eventually going to find the sanitarium in Brackenbury, which is a district of Defiance Bay. And the sanitarium is where they take people who have suffered from things like awakenings, which we also learned from in Act 1 where previous lives are bursting through them and they're driving them slowly insane. So the sanitarium deals with things like that, as well as studying animancy. Animancy being the science of the soul, which we also discussed in Act 1. So once we enter the sanitarium, we can actually talk to the big statue, which seems to be inhabited by the old head warden's soul. So once we talk to this guy, he'll tell us that we are free to ask around if anyone knows about this prisoner of the Leaden Key, because apparently in the past they've had issues with the leaden key probing into their events so he's fine with you poking around and trying to figure out who this is now once you ask around you can eventually talk to the right person on the basement floor and he will tell you that some guy named Cademan Azo has been performing experiments on patients and from there if you go back up and tell this to head warden Ethelmere he will tell you that you know that's not allowed and give you access to the patient ward in the basement, which is where they keep the worst of the worst cases. And he'll ask you to basically go investigate what Azo thinks he's doing. Now once we walk into the patient ward, we can talk to a woman named Freyol, like right next to the door, and she'll explain that the north ward area is where they keep the most dangerous patients, and that Cademan Azo has definitely been taking volunteers for experiments. Now if we go confront Azo about this, he can actually give us the key without us ever fighting him or anything like that. That's not necessary. He'll just give us the key if we just ask. And Freyl also mentioned there's a specific patient in the North Ward who seems out of the ordinary. So once we get that information 
get the key from Azo, we can head to the North Ward where they keep the dangerous patients and talk to a guy named Uskrim at the very far end. Now from this, we use our Watcher's ability to immediately figure out that someone is possessing this man, that the soul we are talking to does not belong to the body that it is in. And it is none other, again, through our Watcher abilities, we can tell that it's the same person who caused us to become a Watcher and, and our soul to awaken at the very beginning of the game. We learn two more important things from this conversation, and that is that, for whatever reason, this man is deliberately trying to discredit Animancy through influencing Cadman Azo's experiments and making Animancy look bad through them, and also that the man who did this to us is able of possessing people's souls in a weird way. From this, there's a short conversation that follows once we get all this information through our Watcher abilities, and then we're basically immediately turned on by all of the patients in the ward because the guy possessing this man jumps into all of the other guards and things and forces them to attack us. Now we need to fight our way out of this or just escape in general, and then we can go back upstairs and talk to the warden statue again. He'll basically thank you for getting the lead and key operations under control and you can choose whether or not to have Cademan Azo ousted for his experiments on patients. Once we leave, we are going to be receiving a messenger from Hadrit House. So, this actually happens regardless of which lead you followed up on first. Whichever one you did first, once that's completed, you'll get this messenger. Now, the messenger is to tell you to go to Hadrit House and speak to a woman named Lady Webb. So we're gonna follow up on that, and once we get down to Hadrit House, we're immediately gonna have a vision outside its doors the about, again, the road man that we've been seeing everywhere, talking to a recruit who is having doubts about the people they are converting to the Leaden Keys beliefs in Wodica. After that, we can go inside, go upstairs, and speak to Lady Webb. It becomes immediately apparent that Lady Webb is a cipher of some renown. Ciphers being people who can dabble in mind magic, basically. They're not psychic, but they can read people's minds. Now, from this conversation with Lady Webb, we actually learn quite a bit. She also has a vested interest in disrupting the Leaden Key's actions, and she also can tell us the name of the man that we are actually after. His name is Theos Ix Arcanon. Apparently, he actually founded the Leaden Key over 2,000 years ago. He is incredibly old because he keeps being reincarnated because he is one of what is called Wodica's favored. Basically, he is Wodica's servant on Earth, and through his Leaden Key, has been doing century-long plots that help Wodica. After this, Lady Webb asks us to keep her informed. It's less of a request and more of a have to, because if Lady Webb dies, the game actually game overs you. And more importantly, if you don't speak to her, you can't actually continue with the plot at a certain point. So again, it's less of a request and more of a have to. And I'll admit this part feels a little shoehorned in compared to the absolute rest of it, which is, for the most part, pretty free and open about how you approach things. From here, we are going to follow up on the tower lead. Now, the tower lead is also actually in Defiance Bay, so it's the next most logical one to follow up on. And basically, we need to go to Heritage Hill. Now, Heritage Hill is a district of Defiance Bay that has been quarantined off because the dead are rising and attacking people inside of it. So in order to get in there, you need to find a way past the guards. You can bribe them, or you can get in good with the Knights of the Crucible, or do a side quest for the Knights of the Crucible, who will then just let you in the door. Heritage Hill is crawling with undead, but what we're looking for here for the main story is a big tower, which is on the western side of the map. Now once we fight our way to the top of this tower, we're going to meet a man named Aldhelm. Apparently, and we could have learned this through the research notes we picked up on our way up, Aldhelm was employed to be doing research on this tower, because it was clearly some sort of ancient machine and they would like to know what it does. However, after the 11th day of studying it, the tower was activated by seemingly a road man who was in the vicinity. They don't know that he activated it, but they did see him do, like running around. And for whatever reason, this giant machine seems to have turned the district into undead. It killed them, and but then basically trapped their souls in place. So even though they're dead, their souls can't move on and their bodies slowly rot. And if they don't kill and eat people, they pretty quickly go insane. Aldhelm is up here trying to 
turn the machine off somehow. But he doesn't know the proper Nguithin language in order to do it. However, he does know someone that does. There is another undead woman in the district named Akantha who should be able to tell us how to do this. And he asks you to go find her. Now at this point, you can kill all Telma if you would like. So from here, we go back down through the tower into the Heritage Hill District and we need to find Akantha's house. Now once we get in there, it turns out that Akantha is also an undead person, of course, and is actively killing people to maintain her sanity. She's pretty freely giving you that information, by the way. It's not really a secret. But more importantly, she is a master of the Nguithin language runes, which are all over the machine. And basically, we can convince her to help us by explaining the proper runes that we need to shut down this machine, should we choose. Talk to her enough, and she'll eventually give you the code. Now, interestingly, before we move on, Akantha mentions that it's possible that this tower here in Heritage Hill was actually a mistake when it was built by the Nguithans, like most of these ancient towers seem to be, because there's actually more of them throughout the Deerwood area here. But for whatever reason, this tower specifically that the Nguithans built actually just traps souls in place, whereas all the other towers that we've seen like this and that Akantha has seen are actually designed to move souls, not just keep them trapped in place like this one. And Akantha's theory is that this might have just been a trial and error thing by the Nguithans. Like, they had to get their knowledge somehow. Maybe this tower was actually just not working as intended and was like an early experiment when they were making these machines. Either way, once we have this information, we can head back up to the tower and either end or overload the machine and basically turn it off one way or the other. And once that machine is off, it resolves the Heritage Hill main quest. Now, for our last lead, which was the ruins that we saw in our vision, we need to actually leave Defiance Bay. And on our way, we will be headed to Deerford Village to see if anyone there knows anything about some ruins nearby that might actually be what we're looking for. This is actually where you can pick up the last two companions. You will pick up a guy named Heravius on the way there to Deerford, and you will pick up the last companion, Grieving Mother, in Deerford. These are, of course, just the base game companions. There are more in the White March, but we're not covering that. Now, once we get to Deerford, if we go into the church that is almost immediately on top of us right as we walk into the area, we can talk to a priest there, and if we give him the right answers, he'll tell us that there is a ruins nearby called Cleoban Relog, and that is clearly where we need to go. So, once we leave Deerford, we can head up to Cleoban, which is being guarded by members of the Glanfathen tribe. And if you remember from the start of the game, the Glanfathens are known to kill anyone who trespasses on these old ruins, because as far as they're concerned, these old ruins are their business. So you can either kill the Glanfathens protecting it, or you can sneak in through a side route. And we're going to have to do some exploring, but the goal here is to find the machine at the heart of the ruins. Because once we get there, we see that once again, it is one of these machines that keep cropping up. The one that was activated at the start of the game, that gave us our powers, and also caused our soul to awaken, and the one we just saw on Heritage Hill that trapped all the souls there. Now we can learn from a dead acolyte of the Leaden Key here that these soul machines are being activated to actively cause the Hollowborn crisis. So that's a huge plot reveal that the Leaden Key is actively using this machinery to prevent the souls from entering the children that are being, being born hollowborn. Now, once we have all of this information, we need to go back to Lady Webb of Hadrid House. And at this point, we can give her all of the information that we've learned from tracking all of these leads down. And basically, you'll both come to the same conclusion, that the Leaden Key is actively causing Widewind's legacy, otherwise known as the Hollowborn Crisis, simply for the sake of discrediting animancy. And at this point, what we need to do is get in on the animancy hearings in the Ducal Palace. In the game here up to this point, we've probably heard about it, I just haven't mentioned it, is that actively going on right now in the Duke's Palace, they are holding hearings about whether or not to outlaw animancy and the practice of these soul magics. Lady Webb explains that you need to get entrance into these hearings, and you can do that by siding with one of the big powers in Defiance Bay. Now this is one of the very few parts of Pillars of Eternity that is time-gated by having to go do side quests. Basically, you need to go to one of these three big powers in Defiance Bay, do up to two quests for them, if you haven't done them already up to this point, and get in their good graces. Those factions are the Crucible Knights, the House Dominell, and the Dozens. Now the Crucible Knights are actually studying animancy and how to turn them into like forged soldiers. House Dominell 
is also pro-Animancy, and they are a criminal organization actually trying to expand their family's influence. And then the Dozens are actually just a military group who are very anti-Animancy. Now, truth be told, it doesn't actually matter what you side with. Like, it's not going to change the next part in any way. What it will decide, however, is how the ending of Defiance Bay plays out at the end of the game. So basically, the Crucible Knights just want help with their animancy projects because they're a little short-staffed at the moment. House Dominell, you have to help with their criminal activities. And the Dozens requires you to steal some stuff from the crucible knights and then do a couple missions for them because again they're a mercenary group so nothing too inspired but you basically pick one do i think it's literally just two side quests for each one and after that they will give you an invitation to attend the animancy hearings at the ducal palace once we are formally extended an invitation we go back and tell lady webb this and then after that we can head to the ducal palace go to the upstairs balcony area where we'll be invited to attend the hearing. But before we do that, when we're talking to Lady Webb, she will explain that the reason she knows so much about the Leaden Key is that she used to be a member. She was like its head cipher. And that she was madly in love with Theos until she realized how terrible what the Leaden Key was actually doing. In the hearing, you can honestly say whatever you want here. It doesn't make too much of a difference because this ends in a very specific way. But you can choose to give the facts about Animancy and explain that these disasters were rather intentionally set, which you will get to at the end. You will explain that the Leaden Key is actively trying to discredit Animancy, and you've learned these things through your ability as a Watcher. And personally, I actually really loved this scene when I first played through the game, because it gives you a lot of chances to like explain either for or against Animancy. However, Ultimately, none of it actually matters because of the huge plot point that's about to happen. After this hearing wraps up and you give your opinion on whether or not Animancy should or should not be outlawed, Theos walks into the room, uses his possession power to possess the head Animancer in the room, and uses that Animancer to assassinate the Duke right there. Obviously, this sets the city into chaos. As you're escaping, you have a run-in with Theos. You get knocked out and you see a vision of a woman being tortured brutally by Theos and the Leaden Key as he accuses her of some crime. And then when you wake up, you're still in the palace and you need to like get out of here. So once you walk outside, like full-blown riots have started and you need to head down to the Hadrid house to speak to Lady Webb about everything that just happened. Now, once you get to Lady Webb, you actually find her corpse. And if you use your Watcher abilities to read her soul, it explains that Lady Webb used her final moments to trick Theos into saying that he is headed for the city of Twin Elms, which is a Glanfathen settlement. And then, after this, Theos promptly murders Lady Webb. But Lady Webb, again, knowing that you are a Watcher and can read souls, knew that you would find her body, and then could read her soul to find out what Theos' next move was. So after he has basically successfully discredited Animancy, and the city is actively rioting and killing Animancers in the street, you can escape to chase Theos down to wherever he's headed in Twin Elms, which is our only lead. And this is the end of Act 2 of Pillars of Eternity. In this act, we came to Defiance Bay looking for the Leaden Key. We found them, learned what they were up to. Unfortunately, they succeed in that plot rather thoroughly. And then we have to escape Defiance Bay to track Theos down to wherever he can find out whatever reason it was that he was headed for Twin Elms. Thank you guys so much for watching. I certainly hope you enjoyed it up to this point. If you did, Please like, comment, subscribe, all that jazz. But in the meantime, may you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day. What's going on everybody? Mortem here, this time bringing you part three of our Pillars of Eternity series. So just as a reminder, we will just be covering the main plot. We're not really touching on side quests so much. We're mostly just focused on the critical path. And in our previous episode, we arrived in Defiance Bay, found out exactly who it is we've been tracking down, which is none other than Theos Ix Arcanon, as well as the Leaden Keys overall goal, and that they are personally responsible for the Hollowborn Crisis, otherwise known as Widewind's Legacy. And at the end of the act, we escaped Defiance Bay, who had descended into riots, and continued on with our new goal of tracking Theos down in the city known as Twin Elms. Now, on our way there, we are going to be attacked by assassins, because the Leaden Key wants us dead at this point, as well as have another vision, just outside of Twin Elms, of the female apostate that Theos seemed to have been trying to quell 
as our watcher abilities give us more and more visions of the past. So when we reach Twin Elms, we are going to arrive in the Hearthsong District. Now, Twin Elms is a Glanfathen settlement, and as such, and especially because of all the events that just happened in Defiance Bay, refugees are only allowed in Hearthsong without permission from one of the six Glanfathen tribes. The Glanfathen tribes live among what they call the Builders' Ruins, the Builders being the ancient society of Inguithans who built all of these ruins of the machines we've been finding along the way. Now, the guards at the gate point us to one of the tribe leaders, who is in Hearthsong, who can potentially give us permission to explore the rest of the city and go to the larger area. So we need to go talk to that leader straight away. She is in a building called the Passage of the Six. Now when we speak to this woman, we basically just need to tell her that we are looking for Theos and we're requesting permission to enter the rest of the city. Now initially, she declines this because apparently Theos caused some sort of problem when he came through the first time. Your watcher abilities kick in and you see a second Orlin who seems to be of the same family lineage who starts giving you information to tell this woman, uh, phrases that only they would know. And through this, this woman realizes that you're someone that can be trusted to pass through the city without destroying things that the Glanfathans consider sacred. She also explains, at least briefly, that when Theos was allowed through, he seems to have desecrated some sacred site. But after this conversation concludes, we should have permission to explore the other districts of Twin Elms. And when we go to the tower that is actually called Ter Evron, we are going to have yet more visions of this previous leaden key life that our soul used to live. If you hadn't pieced that together by now, these visions are of a previous life that has awakened in you from the BOAC at the beginning of the game. So this vision, Theos is instructing our previous life to track down Ayavara. Ayavara, of course, being the female apostate that has been spreading some sort of false faith, according to Theos, and needs to be stopped. And he tasks you with that. Now, once you actually approach the Tower of Terevron and the Twin Elbs that are wrapped around it, you will be confronted by two Delmegan, I believe they're called, but basically they're like dryads. So they'll basically ask you why you want through, and you can tell them about chasing Theos. They, being rather ancient Delmegan, can actually see your connection to Theos and that you are an awakened soul who's tracking him down. However, they explain that even if you catch Theos, he can't undo an awakening. That once a soul is awakened, there is no unawakening it. However, they do explain that if you can give this awakened soul peace, you might be able to overcome it that way. So when souls awaken, it's typically for a reason. And for whatever reason, the soul that awakened in you of this past life seems very connected to Theos. And they explain that while, again, the awakening can't be undone, you might be able to resolve the situation to give that soul peace. And then from there, they go on to explain that Theos came through Tyr, Tyr Evron, went through a path to a place called Sun and Shadow. However, he used some sort of magic to destroy the path behind him, thus the desecrating a sacred site that was mentioned earlier. They further explain that in order to get to Sun and Shadow now, you're going to have to go to a place called Burial Isle that has a great pit at the center of it, and you're basically going to have to jump down this pit. But there is no way to survive this. They make that very clear. And because of that, the only way down this pit safely is to contact the gods. And from here, they explain that Tyr Evron is the place where it's possible to commune with them, that it is a place that pierces the shroud, that is the veil between life and death, otherwise known as the Hall of Stars, and that if you go inside Tyr Evron and pray to these gods, they might just answer you. And that's exactly what you go to do. So you walk into Ter Evron after this conversation with the two Delmegan. You walk into a room. You can activate the altar at the center of the room, which activates four other altars to pray to. These four altars represent the four groups of gods we're about to talk about. Pillars of Eternity Universe actually has many gods, so much more than four. So they kind of group them together a little bit to explain that uh, gods with similar decisions in a later matter. But for right now, what you basically need to know is that you can pray to Rimmergrand, Galloway, Hylia, or Barath. And what they're going to do here is that each one of these is going to give you a quest. Specifically, these side quests are known as appeasement quests. 
where basically the gods are going to give you a quest, and if you complete it and come back to them, they'll talk to you. So explaining what all of them are, Rimmergand, if you pray to that altar, he wants you to go to a place called Noonfrost, which is in Twin Elms. It's actually a shrine to Rimmergand, where a bunch of pale elves who worship him are trying to open what is called the Frost Hewn Breach. They're doing this because Rimmergand is the god of entropy. He is true death. As I explained previously, souls in this world get recycled and they live again and again. However, Rimmergand can eventually destroy souls completely to where the true end. And because of this, these pale elves want to hasten that process, which Rimmergand is not a big fan of. So he sends you to put a stop to it and to seal the breach. And if you do that and come back, that group of gods will talk to you. Galloway wants you to help a situation at his shrine in Twin Elms, known as the Maw, where basically there is a conflict between two great beasts there and you need to settle it. It doesn't matter how you settle it, but make sure only one of them comes out on top and then come back and Galloway will speak to you. If you pray to Hylia, she asks you to go to her shrine, also in Twin Elms, and take care of the giant beast that has decided to take roost on her shrine. It turns out to be a sky dragon, by the way. And then there is the last one, Barath. So Barath will give you a quest to kill two people that have extended their life long beyond what it should, and she asks you to return them to the wheel, because Barath is the god of life and death. So once you do any of these quests, you can come back and talk to, again, the shrine you prayed to, and there will be a bunch of dialogue about your decisions for that quest, but then more importantly, it'll get into the more important stuff. The gods at this point will explain that Theos serves the goddess Wodica, and the reason Theos has been trapping all of these hollowborn souls, as we've learned in previous episodes, but just to recap, Theos and the Leaden Key caused the Hollowborn Crisis, and as we also found out in Defiance, Defiance Bay, that they have been moving all of the souls that they are depriving of these children to a central location, which turns out to be here, a place called Sun and Shadow, which I had mentioned earlier. And his plan is to give all of these souls to empower Wodica, thus raising Wodica above even the other gods and allowing her to rule all and everything. They also explain that Wodica and Theos fear animancy because it discredits gods. Now, interestingly enough, all of the other gods are actually seemingly okay with animancy because they believe it is the kith, that being sentient humanoids. It is their goal and burden and, honestly, their own volition to chase down and find ways to improve upon their own souls and their lives. Basically, the other gods believe it's none of their business if the mortal races are out here pursuing animancy, whereas Wodica and her servant Theos have a big problem with it. Now, more importantly, the other gods won't step in to stop Theos directly because the gods and because the gods have actually all entered into a pact not to personally involve themselves with the kith because it never ends well, as they have established many times. So Wodica, while it might not seem like it initially, is actually also following this pact. You'll notice that she has not directly involved herself in any of these events. She directs Theos, who acts in her stead. Now the next part we learn is probably the most important part. Each group of these gods that we can potentially help will explain that they want you to go down to Sun and Shadow, they want you to kill Theos, and they want you to go to the machine where he has all of these hollowborn souls trapped and disperse them. However, each group of gods, all four different groups, wants you to do something different with the souls. Rimmergand wants you to consign them to oblivion. Galloway wants you to send them back to the Deerwood to empower all of the citizens there. Hylia wants you to return them to the children they actually belonged to so they can live the lives they were supposed to live. And Barath wants you just to return the souls to the wheel to not fix the Hollowborn crisis, but to just return them so they continue on with their cycle of rebirth like they're supposed to. Now, here is where it gets interesting. So this is a big decision, and it will affect the ending slides of this game. But more importantly, depending on your choices and whether or not you choose to adhere to them, you can actually affect the second game a lot with this as well. You can pledge to help one of these groups of gods, and they'll give you power to help you later. You can choose not to actually help any of them. You can uh, agree to not actually make a pact with any of them. Or you can make that pact with them like I just mentioned. 
But interestingly enough, you can make that pact and then also break it. Now that right there has big consequences in the next game. So like there'll be all sorts of stuff. It affects the world state, like the game itself plays out pretty much the same way. But interestingly enough, you can make these packs, break them and do something else. And that will have effects on Pillars of Eternity to Deadfire. Again, just kind of like the world state, not necessarily like the actual overall narrative. Nonetheless, it's probably the biggest decision of the game and it's kind of choosing like the biggest ending of it. But luckily, we don't have to make any of that right now. Unless you, of course, choose to make a pledge and then don't follow through, but basically it's the start of the end, shall we say. Now, as we leave Tyr Evron from this conversation, we'll have visions of Iovara once again, where Theos, again, is talking to your previous life and tells you that they've put up with Iovara long enough, that she needs to be captured and made to confess before all of the leaden key. Theos dispatches you to do this, and he tells you to find a way to get Iovara to move to a place called Osinius, where she won't be protected by an army, and thus can be captured by the leaden key. Now from here, we can head out to a place called the Burial Isle, where that giant pit is, now that we've talked to the gods. Because in addition to all the things I mentioned, they also agree regardless of whether or not you make packs with them, that they will let you jump down the pit and land safely in the area just outside Sun and Shadow. And we head to Burial Isle by going to the place called Old Song in Twin Elms, and there is a boat there that will actually take us to the Burial Isle. And once we get there, as we travel to the pit that we are looking for, we will see many different visions of Iovara and others being tortured as well as a few visions of your relationship with Iovara, because apparently when you had first joined the Leaden Key in your previous life, Iovara had mentored you and taught you the wrong things, and then Iovara made a discovery, turned from the Leaden Key's ways, and then also tried to turn you, but then you were sent to round her up and capture her, which is where the, she then tried to like teach you the different ways Looks that like she had come to realize herself. But ultimately, you still turned her into the Leaden Key, and thus she was captured by Theos and tortured. These are all visions that we see on Burial Isle here. And then finally, we can find the pit and then leap into it. And as long as you made those deals with, well, at least did some of the side quests for the gods that I mentioned, you shouldn't fall to your death. And this is actually the end of Act 3. So, in this act, we mostly did some tracking down of Theos, talk to the actual gods who have decided to help us track down Theos because he's trying to empower Wodica, and they would prefer that her, you know, not be empowered. And so, ends Act 3. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Please like, comment, subscribe. The next video will be the last one for this series. But in the meantime, may you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day. What's going on everybody? Mortem here, this time bringing you part four and the final part of our Pillars of Eternity story series. In the previous episode, we had just gotten down the pit on the burial aisle to reach Sun and Shadow. Carrying on from that point, there's a bit of a text event on your way down the pit, which can actually lead to some injuries depending on what you've got going on stat-wise. And then from there, you find yourself at the bottom of a pit, and then we have to start navigating the ruins. So first things first, there are specters everywhere. But on this first floor, all we really need to do is find Iovara's soul at the end of the map on the opposite side of the dungeon. Now, Iovara is the woman we've been hearing about occasionally as the story progressed in Acts 3 and a little bit of Act 2, and she is the apostate who was with the Leaden Key before turning on them. Now, from this conversation, we get the absolute bombshell of lore reveals, and that is that, brace yourselves, the gods aren't real. So, your previous soul, your character's previous soul, was awakened at the very start of the game in a biowack by none other than Theos. This happened because your old soul used to work for Theos in the Leaden Key, and Iovara was actually your mentor, which is all things we would have learned up to this point, but I'm just recapping. Now, at some point, Iovara discovered while she was working for the Leaden Key that just that, the gods are not real, that the Ingwithans had already figured this out. Theos, uh, that is actually where he was originally from, was the Ingwithan Society. He's very, very old. He's being reincarnated, as again, we've mentioned in previous episodes. Now basically, she tells us to actually give that statement some context about the gods not being real, that the Ingwithans spent uh, generations looking for the gods. 
And after generations, they managed to conclusively find that if there ever was gods, they're no longer here. And that basically, they didn't want the Inguithans, that is, other societies to find this out because they were already crazy, apparently, and the Inguithans were trying to get them under control. So what the Inguithans did was they actually made gods. Now, Pillars of Eternity itself doesn't explain that super well. But as, you know, the Watcher and the main protagonist of Pillars of Eternity, we just spoke with the gods not that long ago. So however the Inguithans did it, they did it for sure. But the key thing to take away from this is that the Inguithans somehow made these gods. They are not gods in the traditional sense that they've always been there and always will be. The Inguithans made these. And, more importantly, Iovara, again, being our mentor from a previous life, and as we discussed in Act 3 on our way to this area, she also can tell us uh, basically kind of more about the context of our previous life, that, as I mentioned, Iovara was your mentor in the Leaden Key, she changed her ways when she found out the gods weren't real and left the Leaden Key, and you were sent by Theos to track her down after a while. And rather than do that immediately, you spent a bunch of time with her and she gave you all of this context. Now your previous life, at some point, still decided to turn her into Theos, and thus she was executed by the Leaden Key while they were attempting to extract a confession of her heresy. She never actually confessed to it because she knows that the gods aren't real, though she does point out she can't actually give you any proof of this. But ultimately, you can reconcile with Iovara's soul here if you want, and basically tell her either you forgive her or you don't forgive her for what, you know, happened all the way back then. But ultimately, from this conversation, you realize that your trouble with Iovara, while significant, ultimately isn't going to give your awakened soul rest and isn't going to solve the problem of the Watcher here being driven slowly insane by his awakened soul. So you need to continue to find Theos to find a way to put peace back into your soul's heart. From here, we go down a floor and we have to make our way through the much cloudier area of these ruins. So. At certain points throughout the dungeon, you'll walk into an area and it'll be shrouded in like all of these black clouds and stuff. And then your watcher abilities seem to activate and it'll clear out these shadows and let you move on after a fight. So after a few of these, you're eventually going to find your way to the actual room called Sun and Shadow. We're going to make our way to the center of this room where Theos will ultimately be. But as we're going, we're going to see all of these spirits popping up, recanting things that we've already learned up to this point. And then we can confront Theos himself. Now you can converse with him a bit where basically you can confront him about the gods not being real. And it becomes quickly apparent that that is what your awakened soul was so troubled by. That your previous life had confronted Theos after learning the truth from Iovara about the gods not being real. And ultimately, Theos would never tell your previous life the actual truth, and it seems to have cost you several lives over the generations, because this keeps happening, apparently. Your previous soul chasing down Theos. But while Theos won't ultimately actually say that the gods aren't real, he does basically kind of admit it in a catfishy way. He goes on to be like, what are the gods really, except ideals and all this? And then he explains that the Inguithans made these gods to give order to all of these heathen societies, as they call them, that were just running rampant and doing despicable things. So basically, the Inguithans made these gods and then used them as a sort of manipulation and control technique on all the other societies, and they've been doing it for basically ever. And then again, as we learned in Act 3, that has finally come to a head because the Leaden Key and Theos himself were responsible for the Hollowborn Crisis that, again, we'd learned in previous episodes, and that they were using Inguithan machinery to move all of those souls here under Ter Evron to the place that we're at right now called Sun and Shadow. And from here, Theos can give all of these souls to his goddess, Wodica, that he actually serves. Ultimately, Theos won't have too much to say beyond that and basically telling us how wrong we are for all the things we're doing. And then at this point, the combat will start. He will ask Wodica for help, which she will give him, and these two giant statues right here will come to life. Now, just some tips for this fight, if you just happen to be having trouble in watching this, I guess. 
You want to kill the two statues first. If you kill Theos, he will actually go down, possess one of the statues, and then actually once that statue dies, will then be like re reinvigorated, shall we say. But if you kill the statues first, you don't have to kill Theos like three times. So focus on the statues and then Theos. Once he eventually goes down, you can use your Watcher abilities on his soul as it is leaving his body and learn the things you need to learn that we've pretty much already discussed, but it'll give you some closure. And moreover, you can decide what to do with Theos's soul individually. Do you send it back to the wheel to be reincarnated endlessly? Do you trap it here like Iovara's soul is trapped? Do you outright destroy his soul so he can never be reborn in any fashion again? Do you just wipe the memory of these events from his soul? You have some options here. Pick the one that's most fitting for you, I suppose. And then, most importantly, from this little bit right here, we learn the words to activate the Ingwithin machinery. And then we can turn around, use this machinery, and ultimately decide the fate of all of the souls from the Hollowborn Crisis. Now, again, as I mentioned earlier, each god, each group of gods, wants different things done with these souls. And in addition to the four groups that we talked to in Tyr Evron, you'll have been stopped by Whale on your way through the catacomby type areas on your way here to Sun and Shadow. And Whale would like them dispersed into mysterious places, just disperse them all over the place and see what happens, because Whale is the god of mysteries. The other options are to strengthen the deer wood with these souls. You can also return the souls to the bodies they were supposed to go to to begin with. You can return them to the wheel to be reincarnated, or you can just outright destroy them and nobody gets them, right? Ultimately, you'll get to see the effects of that decision pretty quickly in the ending slides. Strengthening the deer wood with the souls seems to give you the best outcome, obviously. But that said, returning them to the wheel is actually not too bad either, and giving them back to the children they were originally meant for is also not so bad. But it would seem in my experience that using those souls to strengthen the people who are already alive and kicking so to speak in the deerwood does seem to be the best in my opinion option and then the other big decision is what happens to defiance bay after the riots at the end of act three and that entirely depends on who you decided to side with though in my opinion none of them are that great and then from there you'll get ending slides for all the individual little towns you visited and basically whether or not you did side quests here and there but nothing too important and that guys is going to wrap up our story series for Pillars of Eternity. So again, the biggest lore reveal here is simply that the gods were inventions of the Ingwithans and it led to absolute atrocities. And that's what I like to take away from this game. I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts on the story personally. While I really enjoy the story, I actually don't enjoy playing this first Pillars of Eternity game, which will be remedied by my story series next is next coming which is Pillars of Eternity 2 Deadfire. That game I actually love. Outside of the Divinity series, it's actually one of my favorite CRPGs. With that said, guys, thank you so much for watching. Please like, comment, subscribe, all that jazz down below. Tell me what you thought of the game and the story. I'd love to hear all about it. But again, thank you for watching. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day. ...were many, for Widewind's legacy had come to an end after 15 years. Hollow births ceased in the Deerwood, and a country that only days ago had seemed on the brink of collapse was suddenly on the path to a recovery, a fitter, more resilient country in the preferred image of the God of the Hunt. With the birth of his hollow-born child, the last threads of Lord Radric's sanity frayed and broke apart, his wife the first victim of his wrath. With a fortress to protect him and a garrison of loyal soldiers at his command, he continued to snuff out all signs of resistance from the citizens of Gilded Vale, real or perceived. In the end, all would hang from the boughs of the village's trees, watching over their dead town with vacant eyes. Following the assassinations of Duke Avar Wolfgrim and Lady Webb, Defiance Bay was thrown into political upheaval. In the ensuing weeks, the streets had become the domain of looters and blackguards, Few dared to step outside their own doors alone or unarmed. But order was soon re-established by the Knights of the Crucible, who, despite their depleted numbers, had gained favor in the public eye for their role in unraveling Widewind's legacy.
they were quickly reinforced by returning forces from Fleetbreaker Castle. Having seen both the ills and the promise of Animancy, internally, the Knights quietly began a more cautious exploration of the new science. Depleted in numbers, but bolstered by their newly forged stock of soul-augmented weaponry and a small contingent of forged knights, the Knights of the Crucible would soon become an order few in Defiance Bay would dare to cross. But the opportunity to build upon their newfound power proved too great a temptation for the High Justice. What was at first a measured approach to Animancy soon gave way to a rapid buildup of armaments. The High Justice would eventually seize control of the city for his order and place Defiance Bay under indefinite martial law. Though the machine atop Ter Noaneth had been disabled, it had not seen its last use. Heritage Hill was rebuilt, and no sooner had the first families moved in to resettle the district than members of the Leaden Key, acting under standing orders from their Grand Master, climbed the tower and reactivated the machine. The initiate slew a handful of the new settlers under cover of night and watched as history repeated itself, the victims reanimating and devouring the survivors. After this second incident, the district would remain abandoned. The Duke's assassination at the apparent hands of an Animancer had caused catastrophic rioting in the streets of Defiance Bay, and few Animancers survived the first day. Many Deer Wardens took the end of Widewind's legacy as a sign, both that the gods did not approve of Animancy, and that the purging of Animancers in Defiance Bay had been enough to satisfy them. In time, their rage would subside, and a number of surviving Animancers remained in and around Defiance Bay, often taking to the wilds to practice their science without repercussions. The town of Deerford had seen the last of the Cult of Scan. Dark rumors about the town's many curses quickly faded, and travelers soon returned. The rejuvenation of Cad Nua was a short-lived endeavor. While the rise of a new master had presented new hopes of the keep being restored to its former glory, Time proved otherwise. Plans for maintenance of the structure were postponed time and time again, until ultimately they were scrapped altogether, their master's priorities lying elsewhere. Palagina had gone against the Duke's Bell's orders by inventing a new trade arrangement with the Ammenfoth to accommodate the recovering Deerwood and Market. With the Deerwood's people strengthened by the Watcher's gift of souls, the Valian Republics found themselves struggling to keep up with their new competitors. For her outrageous insubordination and audacity, Palagina was banished from the Republics for several years. After the southern forest of Erglanfoth opened to both the Republics and the Deerwood, the Valians found that the combined efforts of all three nations had created a robust trade network. The Duchessa of Biagethi granted Palagina a pardon for her foresight, though it took many years for her to regain the trust of her superiors and brothers in the Order. Adair chose not to return home to Gilded Vale. Through a number of quiet inquiries, he soon found his way into the underground organization of Aethasians known as the Night Market. Ironically, in learning that the gods had been fabricated, Adair found his faith in Aethas renewed, and that his god was neither alive nor truly a god had become irrelevant. He rose quickly through the ranks of the Night Market for his optimism and for his bold leadership, his ultimate goal to make the Deerwood a place that would welcome followers of the Shining God once again. When the dust settled in sun and shadow, Aloth looked upon the remains of Theos Exarchanon, his former master. He saw where the Grand Master had gone wrong and what would be required to undo the harm Theos had wrought. With a flick of his wrist, he burned Theos's robe, headdress, and every other symbol of the man's power. Never again, he vowed, should Kith live in fear and blind obedience to an authority they did not understand. Armed with the knowledge and courage he had gained on his journeys with the Watcher, he set out on the long and lonely task of dismantling the Leaden Key. After all that he had learned in the Watcher's company, Kanorua could no longer see meaning in his pursuit of the Tanvi Oratoa. He decided to leave what remained of it within the depths of the Endless Paths and return home. Kana bid the Watcher farewell and sailed back to Rawatai, spending the tempestuous journey reflecting on the time he had lost to the pursuit of falsehoods. His family found Kana much changed, his fiery excitement replaced with a weary solemnity.
Determined to change his wandering ways, Kala took up a quiet life as a lore keeper at the college, teaching young students the traditions of their people. With Theos defeated and the souls released from sun and shadow, healthy children were born once again in the Deerwood. The grieving mother sought a place where she might do penance for the birthing bell. She returned to Deerford, where, to the astonishment of the villagers, she delivered the first healthy child in over a decade. She remained there, and with each new birth, she saw a measure of hope restored to the Deerwood and a measure of grace for her own troubled past. Durance continued to blame Woodica for the atrocities of the Saints' War. Believing Magrin to have been a pawn in the machinations of the Queen that was, and feeling that Theos's expulsion had been a step towards reconciliation with his goddess, Durance tried for a time to reopen communication with her. When only silence came, he took it as a condemnation of his continued existence. Ultimately, he built a pyre and threw himself upon it, using his own shattered staff as kindling. You and Sagani never found Persok together. The Adra figurine had gone dark by the time they emerged from Sun and Shadow, and it was another month before Sagani finally accepted that Persok's trail had gone cold again. Her search took her beyond the Deerwood and as far as the living lands. She saw the great coastal cities of Rawatai and the ruins of Old Valia, absorbing the details of these strange and distant lands. Twenty years passed before the Adra figurine finally glowed again. When it did, she followed its signal to a quiet hamlet on the outskirts of Adir. There, she met a young farmer and told her of her past as an elder of Masuk. Sagani returned to a village that had forgotten her face, but remembered her story. Masuk greeted her with cautious warmth, and Sagani found that their ways had become strange to her. She also learned that Kalu had perished of winter fever a few years before, and her middle child, Majuo, had died in a raid. But she found her daughter Yakona a hunter and mother of three, and her son Malak a builder of mighty walls. In them, she came to find her place in the village, and the familiar contours of a world that had changed in her absence. For you, the death of Theos brought an end to your waking visions, and a silence to the whispers of the past. In their absence, you were able to sleep. The questions of a distant lifetime ceased to trouble your soul. All that remained was what to make of the answer. But at the moment, there was little to be done, and the matter would have to wait. A long journey will